we are creating financial systems that work without relying on any specific country. We are creating forms of privacy that work without relying on a yeah, central actor to like hold the infor uh, everyone's information in custody for them. We are creating forms of accounts recovery that don't depend on, um, you know, Google or Twitter having everyone's master keys. Um, so we, so the, and uh, that's happening with uh, social recovery wallets and account abstraction and ERC-4337. Um, we yeah, are creating um, zero-knowledge proof technologies that let people prove that they are trustworthy without revealing any more information about themselves beyond that. Right. So we're creating all of these really powerful tools that in a lot of cases are substitutes for more centralized forms of trust. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Vitalik Buterin on the episode today. He's sharing his philosophy with us. He calls it DIAC, and he explains what he means by it in this episode. I think there's uh, really three reasons we wanted to have this conversation on Bankless. Um, the first is this. There has been a society-wide debate on what to do with technology, specifically AI technology. So we've got the tech accelerationists, that's the EAC community. We've got the tech de-accelerationists, that's the EA community. And the debate is whether we should continue on this path forward towards AI the way we've been doing it, or if we should stop because maybe the robots are gonna come kill us. And I know David and I have been hoping to pick Vitalik's brain on this for quite a while, ever since we had our episode with Eliezer Yudkowsky, who informed us very politely that we're all going to die. So we asked Vitalik, what's his probability of AI doom? The second reason for this episode is I think the philosophy that Vitalik lays out is something everybody in crypto can align on. It's a, it's a way to really unite the tribes. It can help us explain what we're doing here to the world and why it matters. And more important, I think coming out of 2022, when we seem to have lost our way in crypto, it reaffirms why we're here. It's a core part of reestablishing our soul and getting to the bottom of things. And the third reason we're having this conversation, it's Vitalik Buterin, okay? That's enough. He's always got interesting things to say. David, why was this episode significant to you? I think even more broadly, outside of crypto, society at large is having a conversation with itself as to how fast it wants to go into the future. I think there's some parts of society which is concerned about the vanguard of Silicon Valley and tech innovation moving faster than what society can really, as a whole, keep up with. And then there's other parts of society who's like, guys, you solve problems via technology. The acceleration and the speed of technology will help others catch up as well. And this conversation of how fast we want to go collectively as humanity is causing tension in, in society at large. And well, as podcasters, what do we do? We try and define the landscape, define the contours of the conversation, help people learn the perspectives of other sides, uh, discover what is signal versus noise, discover what is truth. And so I think when we have clarity on these conversations, we can all be in agreement in the direction that we want to go. And I think this is really what Vitalik did with his blog and what we were hoping to do with his podcast is help define the conversation a little bit more so humanity can get on the same page. Uh, and so that's why this episode is significant to me. All right, guys, we're going to get right to the conversation with Vitalik on DIAC and his philosophy. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, including our number one recommended crypto exchange. That's Kraken. Go create an account. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade, and as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant permissionless and 24 seven. It's not perfect and nothing ever will be perfect, but crypto is a world changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. 
Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc. PVI doing business as Kraken. MetaMask Portfolio is your one-stop shop to navigate the world of DeFi. And now bridging seamlessly across networks doesn't have to be so daunting anymore. With competitive rates and convenient routes, MetaMask Portfolio's bridge feature lets you easily move your tokens from chain to chain using popular layer one and layer two networks. And all you have to do is select the network you want to bridge from and where you want your tokens to go. From there, MetaMask vets and curates the different bridging platforms to find the most decentralized, accessible, and reliable bridges for you. To tap into the hottest opportunities in crypto, you need to be able to plug into a variety of networks, and nobody makes that easier than MetaMask Portfolio. Instead of searching endlessly through the world of bridge options, click the bridge button on your MetaMask extension or head over to metamask.io slash portfolio to get started. You know Uniswap as one of the largest decentralized protocols with over $1.7 trillion of trading volume, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap X is the newest product from Uniswap Labs, which aggregates liquidity across the ecosystem to give you the best DeFi trading experience. The best part, it's gas free and MEV protected. The best prices, zero gas and MEV protection all rolled into one app. So head over to app.uniswap.org, click the gear icon on the swap page and make sure that Uniswap X is toggled on. And if zero gas trading on Uniswap wasn't enough for you, the Uniswap app is now available on both iOS and Android. Start swapping seamlessly with products from the most trusted team in DeFi. Visit app.uniswap.org to get started today. Bankless Nation, I'm extremely excited to introduce you to Vitalik Buterin. You know him as the creator of Ethereum and Ethereum Researcher, but today he comes to us wearing the hat of philosopher, which is, I think, what we are increasingly need, at least in the sector of tech, as we are having conversations around the world of technology acceleration, as we are approaching new frontiers, both inside of crypto and outside of uh, crypto, that are defining society at large. Vitalik recently wrote this post Uh, My techno optimism, which has made the waves in the tech space about what to do about this increasing pace of technology. And that is the subject here on today's episode of Bankless. Vitalik, welcome back. Thank you, guys. It's uh, good to be here. This uh, post that you wrote, Vitalik, which uh, you subtitled, My Own Current Perspective on the Recent Debates Around Techno-Optimism, AI Risks, and Ways to Avoid Extreme Centralization in the 21st Century, made the rounds inside of of crypto and just immediately outside uh, of crypto as well. And this has been, I think, a continuation of a, a larger conversation that much of the world is having at large with its relationship to the globe's technology sector. So can, can we set up the conversation uh, and kind of set the table, if we will, because this it's happening society-wide. Two camps are forming. There's what is known as now recently the accelerationists, uh, the pro-tech, and then the decelerationists, the anti-tech. I'm not sure if anti is fair. Um, how would you set the table of this global conversation that's being had? I mean, I'm not even sure if uh, two camps is uh, the right way to describe it, uh, because uh, I think uh, what I honestly see uh, in the the world and uh, some of the discussions that have been happening in the world is like people being confronted with these uh, completely new issues were made by completely yeah, new people that they are not used to paying attention to with uh, completely new uh, memes and uh, you know weird vocabulary like uh, Shaw Goth and uh, P Doom and uh, timelines and uh, all of these things, and like almost it's almost like an awakening in that for the first time people are actually thinking because like their existing camps don't really tell them how to think right. Mm. Um, like if you think about the uh, even. Uh, most recent uh, EAC versus uh, uh, effective altruist uh, debate to kind of uh, give very uh, approximate and crude labels to the the two camps. Um, For example, like this is not red versus blue. This is not US versus China. This is not uh, Europe uh, versus Russia. This is uh, not uh, woke versus anti-woke, right? This is uh, basically... uh, a uh, debate that's uh, happening between two groups of people who um, even two or three uh, years ago considered themselves to totally be part of the same tribe, uh, basically the kind of San Francisco-centered, um, you know, like tech-forward, um, AI-leaning uh, uh, gray tribe. 
uh, people who went and uh, in many cases uh, continue to go to the uh, same dinner parties or in the same uh, so social circles. And like suddenly there's this uh, issue that uh, has uh, kind of pulled, basically yeah, pulled them in very uh, different directions. And like if you're coming at it uh, from the outside, then like existing tribal mirrors don't really tell you much about it, right? Because uh, like if you're the type of person who, for example, thinks that tech people are bad be and uh, you know, like these are rich uh, white male dominated uh, fields that uh, are totally yeah, out of touch with the rest of reality, then like, well, guess what? Like both of these camps have uh, a, a very large number of people that uh, fit both of those descriptions, right? And uh, both of those camps have, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, a large number that uh, do not, that also get... Uh, that also gets underappreciated, right? Like uh, there's a huge international audience uh, for um, a lot of these uh, AI focused things uh, because similarly to how uh, within the crypto space, um, things like uh, um, you know, ZK EVMs and ERC4337 are kind of resetting a playing field and giving opportunities to people from uh, you know regions that uh, haven't really been historically well represented um, in Ethereum, I think. Uh, a lot of people around the world, I mean, do also see AI as uh, that kind of opportunity, right? And then, if you're a yeah, left-leaning person uh, who is uh, very skeptical of corporations and who is uh, like pro-governments, um, to put it crudely, but most skeptical of governments when that government is being influenced by corporations, then like, well, guess what? Um, you know, the EIC and EA camps are both, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, influencing of governments and there's like lots of money on both sides right um and so i think uh the way that uh like this conflict really yeah is doesn't uh, map to these existing uh tribal mirrors is uh like it does give like create this uh, interesting property right and that people actually have to like fig figure out for the first time like well you know like what actually is their own perspective on the uh, particular issue and like how do they actually yeah, think about this uh, totally new thing that was uh, not even on uh, most people's radars like even uh, two years ago right and i think like within crypto it's uh, um th the same thing right um in the sense uh, that uh, I, I feel like crypto has uh, operated in a bit of this uh, bubble where like there hasn't really been too much uh, dialogue between like what's happening in the space and uh, some of the yeah, discussions like both technological and political that are happening outside of it right and i feel like there is to some degree this uh, kind of uh, extents to which uh, big parts of the space were born in this uh, 2008 era context uh, where I mean, like, we're talking about like the second, uh, the chancellor being on the brink for the second bailout for banks as the yeah, Bitcoin Genesis block uh, says, um, you know, like literally yeah, as part of the block body, uh, we, yeah, um, the discussions around like ending the Fed, um, creating an alternative to central banks and all of these things. And a lot of the big discussions in 2023 are just totally not related to that at all, right? It's like, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but like the like, you know, like the Israel Gaza situation is not going to be better if there's uh, if those lands uh, ran on sound money, right? It's, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, like same with AI. You know, sorry, like sound money is not going to make uh, you know like P doom go down, right? Uh, so, and uh, and now I, I mean. It is possible to kind of overstate this, right? I mean, I think, like, for example, the re with the recent um, election of uh, Argentina, where, like, I feel so so far totally, yeah, you know, like, unqualified to give a kind of, like, grand, I mean, like, this, uh, this is good, this is bad perspective um, on it. But what I have noticed for the si from the sidelines that fascinates me is that, like, Millet is actually talking about economics. And, mm -hmm. like, Argentinian people do actually care about economics, right? And there definitely is an extent to which kind of the U.S. and the rich countries... Uh, Generally, have I think uh, like as Balaji has pointed out, moved from 
caring about the economic access to caring about the cultural access, right? It's um, like like the issue that emotionally arouses people in the in the yeah, U.S. Uh, these days. Like it's not um, you know like pensions and healthcare and uh, like savings, right? Or at least like that's not what the newspapers report about. But you know, in places like Argentina, it uh, you know like. It still is, and there's uh, like a refreshing sort of grounded in reality aspects to it, but like it's so it's like important to recognize the ongoing importance of that, but also at the same time recognize this growing, rapid emergence of these conversations that have just like nothing to do with any of those questions, and there's this uh, big question of like how does crypto actually uh, relate to these topics, right? And I think. Uh, a lot of people who come into the space come into the space because they have ideals and values and uh, kind of goals and dreams that extend, um, you know, like beyond like like fairly narrow details of like this is uh, you know like what the structure of the money is going to look like. Mm. Yeah, so I think it's important for the space to try to kind of engage in some of those other topics as well, right? Yeah, so the, so. The, I think for a lot of those reasons, like I've been thinking about some of these other technological topics as well. And one of the things that I noticed, especially, uh, you know, like this past year in uh, 2023, is that like I have a lot of beliefs about like blockchains and cryptocurrency and CK snarks. I also have a lot of beliefs about like the importance of longevity research. I also have my beliefs about geopolitics. I also have my beliefs about um, AI and also have my beliefs about effective altruism. But like these sets of beliefs were not really uh, talking to each other enough in a lot of cases, right? And like uh, asking the uh, question of like, what really, uh, like what is it, or your actual take on like how crypto fits into this uh, larger picture of uh, the world and like does that perspective do the different parts of that perspective really like actually make sense in the context of the other parts of the perspective right um it's like uh and even one of the questions that we totally should ask for example is like if ai is so important then like why not drop everything and start working on it right mm -hmm. and like i think there are good answers to that question but i like it is a yeah i'm like a question that actually needs to be asked right um and so yeah like the, so I like I was thinking about um, a lot of these uh, topics, and then of course about a month and a half ago, uh, Mark uh, Andreessen's uh, Techno Optimist Manifesto came out, and then of course an entire spectrum of replies to the Techno Optimist Manifesto came out, um, and then uh, I started uh, um, at least thinking about how I would write this kind of piece, and then uh, you know Zoo Connect and Dev Connect uh, delayed it a bunch, and then finally mm -hmm. yeah you know the uh, Open AI uh, situation uh, just kind of like blasted basically the exact same topic into focus in uh, a lot of people's minds again um and uh, so i decided like i'd actually need to like get this uh document um, out there and here we are yeah it, that, that's what uh, i very much saw in your post vitalik is is kind of like it, it accomplished this goal of maybe creating a, a unified philosophy for crypto in the broader context mm -hmm. of the societal conversation and mm -hmm. and i want to set that up because you know this year is i think the year that the societal conversation between this acceleration view which you called uh, EAC, which stands for Effective Accelerationism for folks that are not familiar, and this more kind of anti-tech type view, um, uh, effective altruism, maybe like to your point, Vitalik. Right. Well, I mean, just like, just to kind of insert a 10 second parenthetical, yeah, I think, uh, just to remember that like as little as two years ago, the main criticism of effective altruism is that these are tech people who believe that like uh, quantitative and technological solutionist stuff is the problem to everything and, mm. uh, you know, ignore the non-tech, the, the non-technical and immeasurable side of life. Right. Um, mm. And so fast forward two years later and now like it's just interesting to note that, um, you know, like they're basically being criticized from the exact opposite direction now. Right. It, it mm. is fascinating. And, and there does mm. seem to be like like to your point, this is all the same tribe that has maybe like in crypto, we'd call this a fork, maybe a social fork, mm -hmm. right? Where we've got mm -hmm. now these accelerationists coming out and saying, whoa, 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 uh, we don't subscribe to kind of some of the anti-tech philosophy of, of some in the AI safety movement. I, I would say that um, bankless listeners maybe, and from you know, David and myself's perspective, were first exposed to this through 
the AI conversation, the AI safety debate. So we had an episode back in February of 2023 with Eliezer Yudkowsky that is like what I would say imprinted on my soul, Vitalik. Okay, so like it was basically the first time I was exposed in depth to someone who's very intelligent and had been thinking about a concept for decades. Now here it was with ChatGPT that the AI posed actual existential threat to um, to humanity. And so we went on a quick side quest, uh, you know, uh, from our regularly scheduled crypto uh, channel to, to explore that a bit. And we uncovered that this is not just a, a question that um, bankless and people in crypto are facing, but it's a societal level question. And it feels like the rest of society is, is you know, the, the reason David um, put this into two camps, I, I realized that there's a lot of, you know, subtlety and, and mm -hmm. granularity between the two camps, but it's almost like society is being asked to choose, right? What do you think about technology? Do you want to hit pedal to the floor yeah. and fully accelerate? Or do you want to just stop, slow it down and just like be cautious? And so I, I'm wondering, uh, Vitalik, if you could give a quick definition for folks that are unfamiliar, what is uh, the accelerationist view? I think you have a, um, a meme of this that opens your article. Uh, and it says like dangers behind utopia ahead. That's the accelerationist view for for you know with respect to technology. And the anti tech view is there's safety behind and dystopia ahead. So we're, we're journeying into this uh, you know uh, we're journeying into this dangerous frontier. I guess I would say is the anti tech view. Mm -hmm. Could you just illustrate the the core viewpoints of of both camps to to ground us in this episode? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so. The way that I would uh, think about the uh, effective um, accelerationist perspective is basically it's uh, like it's all about recognizing the invisible graveyard, right? Um, the uh, invisible graveyard is uh, a phrase that I think either Alex Tabarrok or someone else came up with um, in the context of uh, talking about the harm that the uh, FDA causes in the U.S. just by uh, delaying the uh, extent to which it uh, approves certain drugs, right? Basically, yeah, that if a life-saving medicine gets uh, delayed even by a month because of uh, regulatory hurdles, then like that's something that can easily kill tens of thousands of people. And uh, if you do the math, then the uh, amount of people killed by these things potentially goes way higher. And if you kind of zoom out even a bit more broadly, like uh, in the meme there, right, you have a utopia ahead and then behind you, you have a bear. And the biggest uh, bear of them all is uh, probably aging, right, which is, uh, you know, a, a condition that kills, a, um, you know, about about 60 million, like literally a, a World War II scale uh, number of people every year. And if technology doesn't massively accelerate, the base case is that literally all of us are, um, including everyone listening to this uh, podcast right now, is going to die, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the uh, gains that come from uh, technology are just massive, right? Like, uh, if you just think about the difference between the kind of life that we have now and the uh, life that we uh, have um, a thousand years ago or even 50 years ago, there's just a whole number of both measurable and immeasurable things that have um, massively improved. And like the uh, these improvements are incredibly large and the, these improvements can even overshadow um, uh, some of the worst things that um, happened, even if you can blame some of those things on technology, right? So like if you look at the chart, for example, right, like it, we can understand what some of those dips are, right? Um, so like, for example, if you um, look, there's like a whole bunch of correlated dips in the 1910s. And obviously that's World War One. In the case where there is a double dip, the second dip is the Spanish flu. We're, we're looking, um, then, by the way, bankless listeners, at a life mm -hmm. expectancy chart over the past 120 years or so. Yeah, and it has, uh, I think, about eight lines for various countries, you know, US, Europe, Asia. Um, so there's some dips in the 1910s where there's double dips. It's uh, World War One and Spanish flu. In the uh, 1940s, there's uh, dips, which is obviously World War Two. Then um, China's got a yeah, dip in 1960, which is the Great Leap Forward. And so there's like very visible disasters um, along here. But if you just zoom out even a bit, they yeah, all of these um, dips ultimately are overshadowed by just like the incredibly large gains from medical technology, right? And so grow like growth in technology does um, a lot. And even growth in wealth uh, does a lot, for example, right? Uh, because uh, 
if you imagine a world where everyone is uh, wealthy, then like that's a world where if you suddenly have to like leave your home and pack up and uh, go to another country, then like you're not going to starve. You're going to like basically walk into a much more stable situation than you would otherwise, mm -hmm. right? And so there's just all of these big positives that come from uh, technological uh, gains. And there's like an unrelenting history of thousands of years of uh, technology repeatedly doing good, despite lots and lots of people, um, you know, like screeching and complaining that things uh, could end up going in the opposite direction, right? So that's the accelerationist case. Um, if the um, anti-tech case, I think it's important to separate the kind of old school anti-tech case versus the uh, AI doomer case more specifically, right? Um, so the uh, old school anti-tech case, it's one that I admittedly am, uh, you know, like on balance, uh, very uh, not sympathetic to, and uh, you know, like I've written about this in the article, but I think uh, if I had to illustrate kind of the, the really uh, biggest and most important, um, like the strongest parts of that case, um, Obviously, yeah, the environment and climate change are um, a really big um, aspect of this, right? Um, so there's this uh, chart of uh, how temperatures are suddenly yeah, rising in a way that's like totally yeah, unprecedented in any yeah, um, you know, historical natural situation, except possibly for like, you know, like asteroids that like fell um, you know, like many, many tens of millions of years years ago or something similar, right? Yep, there's uh, there's the graph, right? It just, uh, over the last century and a half, it's just gone vertical. There's graphs of uh, species extinction <clears throat> that are pretty bad. There's graphs of, uh, like, even, like, populations of uh, particular animals that are pretty bad. There's, um, and then another, um, a kind of aspect of this that starts, uh, you know, like bleeding into uh, the uh, AI discussion is like the possibility of uh, technology getting misused by authoritarian governments. Um, but I feel like even like that's not a risk of super intelligent AI, but that is a, I mean, super intelligent AI would make the risk worse, but that even is a risk of like present day AI and like present day surveillance uh, te technology. Um, then there is just the fact that like easier communication um, creates greater economies of scale and that creates greater centralization which uh, uh, creates opportunities for political conflict of a yeah, scale that uh, totally yeah, d did not exist before so you could try to make that argument though i think at the same time like uh, genghis khan would be a pretty yeah, big mm -hmm. counter argument to that right this is uh you know, the guy who uh, genocided about as many people as Hitler back in the 13th century, but then for some reason it's, like, totally socially acceptable to sing songs about him today. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jing, Jing, Jing is kind. Hey, look at oh my God. Yeah, so... You know, there's... Uh, but... but uh, the... Yeah, and then... I think um, on the climate side, like my uh, my counter arguments to that case is basically that like there have been there is a history of lots of uh, specific environmental issues that once they became bad, we actually did get together and solve them. And uh, you know, like improvements in air quality in cities are a big one, right? Like I uh, I remember seeing the tail end of this myself, and the first time I visited in uh, Beijing back in uh, 2014, just remember how incredibly smoggy it is, and like that aspect of China like improved massively and very visibly over the yeah uh, um you know like six years that I went to, to to visit over and over again um since then um so and then you know there's like ozone and like some reforestation in some areas um and, and so forth right so like that would be the counter to the counter um but then the yeah, anti-tech argument that is more compelling to me personally is like this what the this like very specific one about super intelligent ai right and super intelligent ai to me is uh like one something that one way to think about it is to think about it as being something that's in the category of technology so like think about it as being the same kind of thing as smartphones the internet contraception the printing press the wheel guns um 
you know, like the steam engine. And these are technologies that in many cases really were socially disruptive and in many cases definitely did, um, you know, harm people who depended on the incumbents. But at the same time, like if you just look at it from the uh, eye of long term history and you realize that, um, you know, there's massive good that came out of most of them. Um, I mean, guns are, I think, more controversial, right? Because like, like military technology is the one branch of technology where like, it's, uh, I think much less clear that like improvements are good. Um, though, I mean, actually even there, right? There's, uh, an interesting argument that some historians make that, uh, guns are sort of more democratizing than the previous wave of uh, military technology, which was bows, which, uh, you know, required like 10 years of, uh, training to be able to use well and so i uh, kind of enabled um more centralized forms of government but uh you know like even even still right like military technology is like the other big um exception in general right but uh you aside from military technology like on average technology has been crazy good and so if you think of ai as being technology then like your first instinct is going to be ai is going to be crazy good and like maybe you would worry about ai military applications right but if you instead think about ai as not creating a tool but as creating a new type of mind and creating a new type of mind that is far more intelligent and powerful than the human mind, then like this puts us in a totally different category, right? Like uh, if you think about humans, right? Humans have been able to take over and utterly dominate the world and even um, accidentally genocide all kinds of species of animals. Um, in, in most cases, milk without even intending or even realizing that that's what we're doing. And humans got into this position of power entirely because of, you know, our minds, right? Like our, our minds enabled us to create, uh, you know, like tools, technology, better work together collectively and uh, you know, cooperate and do all of these things. And then now imagine an AI that beats humans on that exact same metric, right? By a factor of, uh, you know, like a 10,000, right? Then the question is like, well, what's going to happen to humans? And the big risk here is the, um, comes from this, um, argument of, uh, that I call, um, well, two arguments, right? One argument is the difficulty of alignment. And the second argument is instrumental convergence. Um, so the difficulty of alignment is basically the difficulty of, uh, like just, making a thing that has the same kinds of goals that we have. And this is like a surprisingly hard problem that we just have no idea how to do, right? And like th there have been, um, you know, like plenty of these uh, myths and legends in history that kind of talk about the alignment problem, right? So like there's, um, you know, King Midas uh, who, um, you know, like famously uh, got the touch that turned everything into gold. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, he ended up dying of starvation. Um, then there was, uh, I, f I forget who, but the yeah, Greek um, you know, like mythical figure who wished for immortality but forgot to wish for eternal youth. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's like the problem that if you don't perfectly specify what you want, then like there's lots of uh, ways for that to be yeah, just like slightly satisfied in a slightly different way. Do, do you guys um, remember that? Uh, I think it was an Edgar Allan mm -hmm. Poe short story called like the Mon monkey's paw or something like this, where mm -hmm. uh, the character receives a monkey's paw that that gives him three wishes. And so he would wish for things but, like one of his wishes was um you know his uh his um he, he wished for money uh and what what ended up happening is the monkey's paw granted the wish but his son died later that day in a tragic factory accident and so he received some proceeds from the workers compensation policy like that's how the wishes mm -hmm. were were fulfilled it reminds me of that as well mm -hmm. yeah now I mean, I think um, one uh, kind of rebuttal to this that like lots of people make and uh, that I've made is that like, if you think about, if you just interact with, uh, you know, like e existing AIs, like even chat GPT just a little bit, like these are not, um, you know, hyper autistic robots that have no idea how to understand like context and uh, unexpressed <laughs> intentions and subtext, right? Uh, like, uh, 
like JGPT will totally be able to understand that, uh, you know, if uh, a human says, I want anything I touch to turn into gold, he, um, you know, like has an exception in mind for things like food and water and medicine, right? Um, but uh, there is, well, like this by itself doesn't um, save us. And it gets a little bit more tricky to sort of explain why, right? But, uh, but like, I, I can try. Um, basically, yeah. I mean, the best analogy, unfortunately, is kind of uh, like looking at some of the previous uh, generation of AI that we've had. Like, remember back in the mid 2010s when people were starting to work with deep learning AIs for the first time and they were starting to get like kind of good at making pretty pictures? And there is like a thing that you can do where you can run the model forwards. And if you run the more model forwards, you pass in an image and it tells you like, is this thing a cat or is this thing a dog? But then you can also run the model backwards, right? And you can pass in the input that like, I want to, uh, the ultimate essence of a dog. Like I want the thing that really is gonna be 100% dog. It's gonna maximize the extent to which this classifier is gonna tell me that this thing is definitely a dog and it's not something else. And then you run it through and it generates the image that maximizes that. And, it turns out that what you get is totally not a dog, right? What you get is like some insanely crazy contraption that definitely like has doggy aesthetics, but it's also got, I mean, like maybe 12 eyes, maybe 48 eyes. Maybe there's like a whole bunch of dogs that have merged bodies. It just like looks like some totally crazy thing. And I'm getting visuals of a kaleidoscope of a dog. Right, exactly, right? And, like, this is the thing that, like, maximizes the dog parameter, right? Mm -hmm. And I think another example is, like, he, us humans have sort of hacked evolution in the same way, right? So, like, if you think about what evolution is, evolution is, like, this agent that uh, has a goal, right? And its goal is to, like, maximize the yeah, reproductive fitness. So, you know, survival times how many children you have of whatever agents it's operating on in their environments, right? And in order to fulfill this objective, evolution gave humans a lot of desires, right? Like there is the desire to have um, food, the desire to have delicious food, right? And uh, del like what what is delicious and what isn't delicious? Well, those are things that we're fine tuned based on like what is nutritious in the, in the natural environment, right? Um, and then there's the uh, desire, a lot of desires associated with reproduction. There's uh, um, you know, like desires associated with survival and all kinds of things, right? But then look at how modern humans have uh, dealt with these desires, right? And one is we've created a lot of food that's like hyper optimized for deliciousness that in a lot of cases doesn't uh, do well at all on uh, nutritional value, right? Um, we have invented at least like five separate different types of technology that let people have sex without uh, getting pregnant, right? We've uh, um, invented all kinds of things that like satisfy the proxies that evolution has created in our minds for evolution's goals, but that do not actually satisfy evolution's goals at all, right? And um, you know, the results of this is that like lots of people are eating unhealthy food and there's uh, increasingly a uh, depopulation crisis with lots of countries having fertility rates that are below one, right? Um, and so it's... Uh, now, one thing you might ask is like, well, surely, you know, like we as humans know that we are not following the goals of Mother Nature. And the answer is yes, we know very well that we're not following the goals of Mother Nature. But guess what? We are humans. Our goal, like the in maximizing reproductive fitness is the goal that Mother Nature had. The, it is not the goal that we have. And we know that Mother Nature was not able to perfectly sort of copy its goal into us, but we don't care. Yeah. We, we have our goals and we follow what our goals are, right? Mm. And so we, in the case of AI, what might happen is like, we tell the AI, um, you know, like as Alex Friedman would say, to like, I'm um, you know, like bring more love and peace into the world. Um, and then the AI would discover that like, okay, here's a bunch of things that look like love and peace. And uh, these are things that we would all recognize as being love and peace. But then at some point it would discover like, wait, if I create this 47 dimensional squiggly that looks in this particular way, then like it's going to be even better at max like 
satisfying its own internal conception of uh, you know, like love and peace, which is going to be slightly off because anything is, uh, that is created by any finite process is going to be slightly off. And uh, this uh, 47-dimensional squiggly is going to look incredibly lovely and peaceful to the uh, AI, but it's like nothing that any of us would recognize as being um, love and peace in any sense, right? And then we go and tell the AI, bring more love and peace into the world, and then the AI just kills all of us and replaces us all with 47-dimensional squigglies, right? <laughs> um, so this is kind of the AI safety case, right? I mean, this is... Uh, Basically the same as uh, you know like what I remember, um, Eliza Rudkowski yeah, told you guys, and it's sort of the same thing as what a lot of people have said. Um, so this is like one of my uh, points of concern regarding AI. But um, in my post, I also talked about two other points of concern regarding AI, um, where one of them is just this question of like, well, even if everything goes well, um, like is this actually a world that we would want to live in, right? And it turns out that like if you examine the sci-fi worlds that people have tried to come up with that that show um, you know humans and bots living in harmony then like either the world is like insanely unrealistic and it's just unstable and it's just obviously going to collapse into ai's dominating everything in what you know like in another one to 10 years or it's like a world that actually really feels quite deeply unsatisfying from uh, like most people's perspectives today, right? Like we're basically talking about a world where, um, you know, we bec we all become pets of the yeah, super bot and uh, a kind of human agency doesn't really play any part in, uh, you know, determining which way the universe goes from there. And by right? the way, Vitalik, for, for those that, mm. that maybe doubt that um, a, a bunch of machines or a bunch mm. of computers could actually wrest control over humanity, I... When I was reading your article, I, you know, I was in kind of a serious mo mood and I was drinking some coffee. I literally spat out my coffee laughing at this, uh, this turn of phrase you used. You said this, to see why the machines could wrest control over humanity, imagine that you are legally a literal slave of an eight-year-old child. If you could talk with that child for a long enough time, do you think you could convince the child to sign a piece of paper setting you free? I have not run this experiment, but my instinctive answer is a strong yes. And so all in all, humans becoming pets seems like an attractor that is very hard to escape. I was just visually visualizing in my mind, trying to convince an eight-year-old uh, child to, to set me free and what that process would, would look like. And that's kind of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with a super intelligence. It's, uh, to, to, to them, we would be that eight-year-old child. It would have probably yeah. no trouble convincing us uh, to do whatever it wants, to fulfill whatever outcome uh, a go and, and set of goals that it had. Yeah, and then the other thing to keep in mind is um, that, like, to the extent that there is any notion of uh, competition in this uh, world of the future, like, whoever really gives up control of the reins to the AI is going to outperform the people that don't, because, uh, you know, like, that's what happens in chess, that's what happens in Go, that's, uh, you know, just what eventually yeah, happens anywhere, right? Um, so... That and then the third risk that I uh, um, outlined is basically, yeah, you know, centralization and surveillance, right? And this isn't even just a risk of super intelligent AI. It's a risk of like basically AI of the type that exists already. And this is um, actually in some cases situations that happen already, right? Um, so uh, one of the things that's been happening in Russia for the yeah, past while, actually, yeah, even uh, quite a bit before the uh, recent war started, is that uh, you'd have uh, uh, protests, right? And uh, the unfortunately, yeah, you know, the authoritarians discovered this one weird trick, which is you let the protest happen, and you, uh, you know. You send the police out and, um, you know, like you do the usual, pro uh, you know, like protest versus police thing a little bit, but like you don't aim to crush it right then and there, hmm. but you have the cameras out and then you identify who all of the key people in the protest are. And then at some point later at 2 a.m., they get a knock on the door hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, like repeat and, re and uh, rinse about a hundred times. And uh, five years later, suddenly you have uh, like basically yeah, almost no one left uh, to lead the protests, right? And meanwhile, and, every other single country is like, oh, this is a normal functioning, you know, society mm -hmm. who's expressing their desires and they are free to express their desires. Exactly. Yeah, it's like much less visible, which makes it uh, kind of much more difficult to coordinate against. It's and 
Um, you know, it makes it much more difficult to um, even create outrage against it internationally. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a big problem. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, like a big part of the yeah, reason why, yeah, like it feels like protests against authoritarian regimes have been getting less and less effective for the past while. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like, if you just extrapolate this trend even further, then the risk um, basically is that uh, like, there isn't a place to hide anymore, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a place where any kind of uh, credible opposition movement to a uh, government could even start, because as soon as it starts, the surveillance can detect it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you, you don't even need, uh, like, physical police. At some point, the uh, AI soldiers could just, uh, um, you know, I could go and shut it down. And uh, this uh, gets even worse when we think about wars, uh, because uh, like the need to get the population on your side has historically like actually been a pretty significant break, um, at least uh, slowing down uh, people's uh, desires uh, to uh, go to war. But then, if uh, your entire army is a bunch of uh, robots, then like you know the dictator gets drunk at 10 p.m. They uh, see someone being mean to them on Twitter at 11 p.m. and uh, the drones, I um, mean, you know, like start uh, flying and raining hellfire on other countries before midnight, right? Um, and so this like, kind of natural check and balance that comes from the fact that like whatever ultimately there are decentralized humans that have to be doing the executing and if you try to do something really terrible then like those humans are going to be demoralized and uh you know, they're going to be much less uh, they're going to be much less willing to um go along with your plans and uh even if they do lots of them are going to leak every single detail of uh, your plans to uh to the CIA or to whoever your opposition is which is uh Actually, yeah, another thing that, uh, you know, fortunately, yeah, did happen in Russia. Like, once, uh, you know, like you have uh, AI armies, like all, all of those checks and balances go away, right? Um, and so this is my other big um, concern about AI. Like, basically, is this sort of, you know, the ultimate centralization from which uh, at some point uh, there might not actually be an escape? Um, so... That so those three cases are my yeah kind of big uh, you know like note of caution on artificial super intelligence in particular and how it's like pretty unique and pretty different from all the other other technologies that we've uh, dealt with over the past uh, you know, like ten millennia. Okay, Vitalik. So so David's gonna gonna come in and summarize this in a in a moment. So we're tracking our our journey so far through this, and then we we want to kind of introduce your your philosophy here and what you think the counter mm -hmm. is and how that applies to. Crypto, but I have one follow-up mm -hmm. question that uh, to you specifically mm -hmm. that's been kind of burning mm -hmm. in me since the uh, Eliezer um, podcast mm -hmm. in, back in February, and that is, mm -hmm. what do you think? Like, so we, we talked about three different uh, AI risk scenarios. The first is doom, basically we all die. Mm -hmm. The second is we become pets, and I'm like, at this stage, it's better than one. That's not so bad. And then the third is totalitarianism. But I want to mm -hmm. go back to the first because that that's been giving me like an existential crisis all year. What's mm -hmm. your personal take on this? I, I know you've got a, a spectrum in your uh, article on on what you called mm -hmm. earlier the probability of doom, the p doom ratio. What's mm -hmm. what's your p doom ratio, and uh, and why? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how where you weigh in. Yeah, uh, so the uh, number I gave in my tweet thread is uh, zero point one. So I'm um, you know ten percent chance uh, super intelligent AI is going to kill us all. Um, and I think the reason for this is like. I see both sides of the arguments, right? Like I see the yeah, sort of quote doomer arguments, which uh, basically yeah, is uh, essentially what I've already outlined to you guys. And then I think uh, if I had to give the counter doomer arguments, I would basically say something like, uh, you know, look at the kinds of AIs that we have now. Like those kinds of AIs are not even goal seekers. They basically yeah, are things that, you know, like put on human costumes and uh, sort of play out roles of uh, the uh, type that, uh, you know, to uh, of like what whatever uh, type they sort of pattern match themselves into thinking that they're in a, at that particular moment, right? Like uh, ChatGPT, it does not act like something that maximizes any particular objective. Um, and like if you uh, tell it to make the world more doggy, like it's not going to do anything that looks like um, you know maximize the assets of dog, right? It's uh, going to um, you know just. Uh, 
do like give you a five paragraph essay that's like a pretty normal and human thing that like expresses like what might it mean to make the world a more doggy place and uh, it's the sort of thing that's like pretty yeah inoffensive and like it looks it may look pretty fine right um so basically yeah if you just compare um you know the specific scenarios that um it people Uh, people worrying about AI yeah, feared would happen with AI at current level of capabilities. And then you compare that to like the actual thing that AI at current levels of capabilities does. And like, it's always quite different, right? And one thing I'm happy about is that I feel like the, yeah, the level of um, like harm from deep fakes in particular so far has been much lower than what I think most people expected and even what I expected at current levels of capabilities, right? Like if you t explain to someone from, t uh, b from back in 2015 what the current level of capabilities of AI making deepfakes is, like they're probably going to tell you like, whoa, like we can't trust anything that people say anymore. Like this is going to totally break elections and it's going to lead to all kinds of horrible consequences. And, like, some bad stuff has happened, but, like, the reality is much less than that fear, right? Which is, like, interesting and uh, surprising. And, like, it, uh, I mean, to some extent, it shows the yeah, avail the um, adaptability of mankind. To some extent, it shows that mankind is less evil than some people fear. Um, but, and then, of course, the Doomer would sort of counter by saying, well, guess what? Like, with uh, super intelligence, neither of those two things even matter. Uh, because the AI is going to be doing all the work. Um, but, like, it does still feel true that sort of the way that things keep progressing do sort of uh, go in different directions uh, than um, what, uh, you know, like people's existing worst fears have uh, been. And in ways that sometimes feel like we're going further and further away from the kinds of, uh, you know, like hyper um, optimizers that people are afraid of. Um, so... That's the case against. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if I had to, like, again, counter the counter, I would say, well, that's LLMs. And it's in looking very possible that, like, LLMs basically tap out at some level of capability. And, uh, you know, like, GPT-4 and, like, a little bit better than GPT-4 is, like, basically what we're going to get. Um, but then there's going to be some next technology which like could be combining LLMs and Q learning, like, you know, it could be something else. And uh, like, we don't even know what, what property is that next uh, level of technology is going to have. And so it's like a big washout, right? Um, and so I think like there is a big probability uh, chance that the AI doom problem is just like, it, it, it turns out that it was never that big a problem to begin with. There is like a big chance that it is a really big problem. And within that chance, there is a really big chance that it is a really big problem, but um, you know, with uh, awareness and hard work, we will be able to um, deal with it, and uh, you know, like make sure that we don't actually yeah get doomified, right? Yeah. So that's where sort of the I think the balance comes in, right? But like, it's important to keep in mind that like a ten percent probability of doom is still a big deal, yes. right? So like, for example, <laughs> like one analogy for this is like ten percent is like I think greater by somewhere between a factor of one and three, I forget, like, but it's like that, like only a little bit greater than the probability that um, any of us is going to die from a yeah, non biological cause. Um, and so, if you think like about an like accident, the a car amount accident of, or something like this, right? Car accident, homicide, suicide, like any nasty thing that's uh, not disease. Um, mm -hmm. Then, like if you think about the amount of uh, just like care and effort and thought that you personally put into your physical safety, and the amount of like care and concern that you expect, I mean, like governments to put into your f uh, physical safety with things like police, then like roughly that level of care is a reasonable level of care to have about, um, you know, the possibility that something really bad is going to happen out of AI, right? And obvious, like, and that doesn't mean, like, overturn the entire world to suddenly care about this problem, but it does definitely mean care about the problem more than we do today. 
Arbitrum is the leading Ethereum scaling solution that is home to hundreds of decentralized applications. Arbitrum's technology allows you to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. Arbitrum has the leading DeFi ecosystem, strong infrastructure options, flourishing NFTs, and is quickly becoming the Web3 gaming hub. Explore the ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. Are you looking to permissionlessly launch your own Arbitrum Orbit chain? Arbitrum Orbit allows anyone to utilize Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Orbit Orbit chain, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, an enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Visit Arbitrum.io and get your journey started in one of the largest Ethereum communities. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. And now, something big is happening. Introducing the Celo Layer 2. It's a game-changing proposal that's going to bring Celo's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared his excitement for the Celo Layer 2 on the Celo forum. So has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one block finality. What does all that mean? Rock-solid security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum. Follow at Celo org on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Introducing GMX, the deepest on-chain futures market to trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and leading altcoins. GMX is a permissionless, decentralized exchange that offers perpetual futures and spot trading, lightning fast trade execution and competitive pricing with the security and self-custody of a decentralized exchange. GMX is live now with V2, bringing new optimizations to on-chain leverage trading. And even more than an improved trading experience, GMX will reward you for just participating. All GMX users can easily set up a referral link. And with $12 million of Arbitrum grants being distributed as incentives and over $150 billion in trading volume to date all settled on chain, GMX is leading the charge in terms of opportunities for DeFi liquidity providers. The future is on chain with your wallets, with your trades, and with your money in your own hands. Try it out now at app.gmx.io. So Vitalik, I want to um, kick the stool and throw us all the way back to the start of this conversation. We just went down like mm -hmm. this AI rabbit hole to talk about mm -hmm the potential risks of yeah. acceleration, uh, which is mm -hmm. one of these camps that has kind of emerged in thought mm -hmm. as this society, as our society is having this conversation. The the risks of going forward in time and accelerating our progress with technology. Mm -hmm. And you've labeled like, well, AI is this exceptional case that we need to consider the circumstances of. Some other uh, examples are like climate change. There seems to be a correlation with the increased risk of climate change and the quickening of technology. And this is the this is the decelerationist camp. Uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the accelerationist camp, which I think you have said that you more are more resonant with, says that, well, there as technology advances, we find these occurrences in history, these wars, these increased capabilities to cause harm. But by and large, they are completely drowned out by all the other focus in the, all the other developments of technology. We've kind of like set the stage for these different uh, constructs of thought. Mm -hmm. And like all extremes, they're all relatively blunt if you will, if mm. you just only focus mm -hmm. yourself in one school of thought, it's a blunt it's a blunt tool for the job. And as we progress forward in, in your article and in your thought, uh, we start to get a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more. Uh, we don't have to be so blunt in our thought about the direction of society. We can pick and choose components from different schools of thought and put them all together. We understand that AI has risks. We understand that we have to solve climate change. Uh, we understand that technology presents new risks, yet nonetheless, technology also helps us navigate those risks all the same. So rather than having to pick a an extreme, pick a tribe, if you will, a school of thought and be shoehorned in there. How would you propose we think about all of these different things that we've uh, put mm -hmm. together here? If we're talking about a unified idea of thought, mm -hmm. how would how would we have a framework for understanding if we are going to go forward with technology, mm -hmm. what is the mm -hmm. correct path, the more, the more optimistic, more uh, precise path that we can maximize mm -hmm. the good? Because really all of these conversations are all about how do we maximize human welfare and well-being at the end of the day? Uh, mm -hmm. How would you proceed in this conversation from here? 
Yeah, so I think this is where the uh, idea of DAC that um, I came up with uh, in, in the post uh, uh, really uh, comes out of, right? So um, ACK is obviously acceleration, and D is uh, intentionally uh, um, standing for uh, primarily for defense, but also for uh, like de decentralization and uh, democratization. Um, and so the yeah, idea of this philosophy is to basically yeah, look at the yeah, offense versus defense uh, balance uh, of the world, right? So basically look at, um, you know, like how easy is it uh, to um, do things that, uh, you know, like harm or go against uh, the goals of other people uh, versus uh, how easy it is to protect yourself uh, or your community against that. Um, and think of that as something that all is and has always been shaped by technology, but also something that can be shaped by uh, future choices in technology. And to really focus on building defensive technology, and especially, and I think this is the uh, angle that uh, uh, is really naturally appeals to um, people in Ethereum and people listening to this, defensive uh, technologies that work by improving defense in the abstract without uh, kind of coming with a built-in perspective um, uh, or a, a built-in enforcer that decides I mean like what is good and what is bad across the entire world world or across uh, an entire ecosystem right um and you, would you uh, say like uh, it's phrased differently mm -hmm. defensiveness as a platform or just a technology platform mm -hmm. that allows defensive mm -hmm. technologies to emerge the word the word platform is interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, I feel like this is, um, you know, like one of those sort of sometimes VC buzzwords that means um, mm -hmm. a lot of different things. Um, the um, the part of platform that appeals to me is like this uh, idea that we're that a, a lot of this is going to create involve of creating common infrastructure and uh, both. Defensive infrastructure and even uh, common infrastructure that enables building many kinds of defensive infrastructure. The part of platforms that I'm uh, kind of like I will I want that that cautions me against embracing that word is that a lot of things in the modern world that call themselves platforms are things that do contain this uh, centralized actor mm -hmm. that controls the thing and that plays this right. role of um, you know, deciding who's good and who's bad, right? Like we talk about Facebook being a platform, I mean, like OpenAI being a platform, Twitter being a platform. And like all of these things have centralized actors that run and control them. They have uh, centralized forms of uh, moderation. They mm -hmm. have uh, um, you know, centralization on all kinds of levels. And this is uh, one of those things that creates a lot of problems, right? Um, so uh, there's this uh, book that was written recently that talks about this uh, concept of weaponized interdependence. And basically, uh, this idea that uh, the type of technology that we've been building for the past 20 years, and when I say we, like, I do mean, you know, the centralized world. Like, this is the place where the decentralized world gets to pat itself on the back and say, like, yeah, no, we're actually better than that, is that... The technology has been networks technology, and it's been it's networks technology that creates centralized choke points where the creator of the technology has ongoing power over the users, right? Like if you think about um, just going back to the year 1970, and let's say yeah, like uh, let's uh, pick um, you know like a random country that has powerful um, technology that we don't trust. Actually, let's just like not um, say anything bad about anyone in the physical world. Let's say you have like Mordor, right? Like, let's mm -hmm. say, yeah, you know, like you have um, literal Mordor and it just like pops up in the middle of the Atlantic. And it turns out that that's what Atlantis was the whole time. And it's a technological <laughs> superpower, right? And uh, imagine you're in the 1970s and you're buying cars and forks and knives and all kinds of things that are made in Mordor. And we ask a thought experiment of like, what what is the worst that the Mordorians can do to you? And I think uh, probably the worst that they could do is uh, one, they could do false advertising. They could create um, things that look like they satisfy certain properties, but actually like way underperform on durability or on safety, for example, right? And like that is bad. Um, the probably yeah, 
the most evil thing that they could do is like what we call the razor blade model, right? Like basically, yeah, sell you devices, but then it those uh, devices end up kind of depend depending on these uh, sort of attachment parts that have to constantly get renewed. And it turns out that Mordor is the only vendor of those. Um, so, like that's the the closest that you could that Mordor could do to like real to like really getting power over you just by being a vendor, right? Otherwise, it's like even if you're like very um you know um you know like anti yeah Mordor and you have a yeah um you know Sauron must die yeah um you know like poster on your wall and uh, you know like you go around wearing uh, you know free serif on gold t-shirts like Mordor can't really do much to hurt you right um but. Then fast forward to 2020, right? In 2020, we have networks technology. And if Mordor builds smartphones and you use a smartphone from Mordor, well, the smartphone can spy on you. Um, if you use internet platforms for Mordor, those platforms can censor some political viewpoints and uh, promote other political viewpoints, right? And it's going to tell you that like, hey, yeah, you know, this uh, free serif on goal thing is like actually yeah, a bunch of terrorists and, and uh, you know, like nobody's allowed to support them anymore. It can affect, uh, you know, the domestic politics of other countries. It uh, can... Uh, um, at any particular moments, just like flip a switch and uh, take um, like take away the technology from any subset of its users, right? Um, and so the amount of power that you have over users by being the producer in a central in at least if you're building this kind of centralized network technology has just gone way up now compared to what it was in 1970, right? Um, and so. The yeah, like that's the aspect of platforms that actually yeah, it's one of the things that this is even reacting to, right? It's even one of the things that the yeah, I think crypto space is really yeah reacting to, right? Um, and so the goal here is to build defensive technologies that are not like that, right? Defensive technologies that do not assume that like they are being built in America and Amer and they are going to be good because everyone in the world agrees that America is good, right? Because, uh, you know, unfortunately, this kind of consensus does not exist in the world, right? And uh, like what we want to do is we want to build um, technologies where people can trust them, even if they have different uh, opinions on um, like what what's good and what's bad. And these are technologies where there exist a lot of uh, really interesting examples of already, right? So I yeah, split defensive technology into four different um, parts, right? Where I t like the first split is uh, the split between the world of bits and the world of atoms, right? And uh, in the world of atoms, you have uh, defense against big things and defense against small things. And defense against small things is, of course, uh, biodefense. And then in the world of bits, uh, we have uh, what I call cyber defense, which is like defense against things where if you look at them hard enough, it's obvious that they're attackers. And then what I call info defense. And this is like a very specific distinction that I think other people haven't quite made in the same way. That basically yeah, is about defending against things where there is much less consensus about who the attackers are, right? Um, and... Uh, the big um, example here is what we call misinformation, right? Like people don't want to be misinformed. People want to know the truth and not know false things. Um, but a lot of the sort of quote anti-misinformation ideas that have been proposed by the, uh, you know, like the mainstream world or you know, what we might call the centralized world, they all involve there being a yeah, particular actor who understands what's right and what's wrong and uh, basically forces that perspective across an entire ecosystem, right? Um, and so the question is like, well, can we build tools that actually avoid having that central point of uh, like deciding what's good and what's bad for everyone? Um, and so in the case of like the world of atoms, this is kind of um, somewhat easier. Um, so I yeah, like in the world... For macro, for example, I talk about building resilient physical infrastructure. Um, so, um, you know, even like the fact that we have solar panels and the fact that we have such amazing batteries now is like amazingly good, right? And if every household had those kinds of things, then like the amount of disruption that would happen to people's lives, even as a result of, you know, cyber war or even regular war, would just would already be significantly lower, right? If we had much more distributed agriculture, then like that would improve things even more, right? 
So there's things that are just like obviously defensive without having to like come with an opinion attached of like who is the one that you're trusting to do the to do the defending for you. And then in the bio space, like there's vaccines, there's other kinds of prophylactics, there's things that boost your immune system. There's like and then like I yeah basically yeah talk about how there's like this entire set of things that we can do that we totally are not putting enough resources into right now that could totally cre create a much more um, airborne pandemic resistant world where we have much less COVID, much less long COVID, and even much less um, you know colds and flus, and where lots of diseases would basically stop before they even start because there are zero would it would, would it end up even being less than one in this kind of world. But we we just need more funding and more effort to actually make this world this um happen. And then in the world of bits, this is where crypto stuff really starts coming in somewhat, right? Um so like one of the things that I began this whole episode with is like asking the question, well, you know, crypto needs to also think about some of these um, you know, like issues that people are really yeah, thinking a lot about in 2023 and what is the way that crypto has placed into some of those concerns. And like, here it is, right? Like, basically, yeah, we want to create a world that has uh, much more digital hardness uh, baked into it by default and where digital attacks become much harder um, and uh, digital defense becomes much easier, right? And what's interesting about like the cryptocurrency and blockchain space is that it's great at doing that without relying on a uh, single centralized party, right? Um, so, you know, we we are creating financial systems that work without relying on any specific country. We are creating forms of privacy that work without relying on a yeah, central actor to like hold the inform uh, everyone's information in custody for them we are creating forms of accounts recovery that don't depend on um, you know google or twitter having everyone's master keys um so, so that and uh, that's happening with uh, social recovery wallets and account abstraction and erc4337 um we yeah, are creating um, zero knowledge proof technologies that let people prove that they are trustworthy without revealing any more information about themselves beyond that, right? So we're creating all of these really powerful tools that in a lot of cases are substitutes for more centralized forms of trust. And one of the arguments that I make in that section is basically that like one of the reasons why the internet has become more centralized and uh, a less free place over the last 15 years is basically because like the the there are threats and the easiest and laziest responses to threats that you could implement are responses that involve centralization right like require everyone to have a google account to sign in and like that's your anti sybil mechanism right mm -hmm. and uh, the question is like well how can we actually bring privacy back how can we uh, actually bring you know the ability for anons to participate in the internet back how can we um, actually yeah let people um, do all of the things that they need to do without um, creating these mechanisms where like, if you're in one of the, you know, quote, good countries, then you're trusted. But if you're in, um, you know, like one of the yeah, untrusted countries, then like you're screwed. Right. And mm -hmm. like, these are things that actually happen, right? Like, uh, I mean, I love community notes, for example, and I talked about community notes very positively, but I remember there was this uh, one thing about it that, uh, at least when I checked uh, a couple of months ago, in order to join Community Notes, you needed to have a phone number from a, quote, trusted carrier. And I remember seeing a tweet from someone in India basically saying, like, hey, guys, you just made, like, one of the major carriers and carriers in India that serves hundreds of millions of people mm. untrusted. Mm. And, like, there's this big population that's, like, 5% of the world that's, like, locked out of being a Community Notes participant. Mm. And, like you can see how those kinds of problems just naturally come out of this centralized uh, perspective on trust. Um, and so if we can create like better and decentralized alternatives, then like this uh, ends up really solving that kind of problem as well. Right. Um, so that's cyber defense, right? Basically all of the yeah, stuff that we've been working on in terms of, uh, you know, creating more decentralized and more robust financial systems in terms of creating these zero knowledge proof systems that let us, uh, 
you know, prove that we're good guys without revealing any other information um, that let us prove computations, like all of these things, they yeah, make a much more defense favoring world. And so it's amazing that um, you know, our space has been accelerating these uh, technologies so much, right? Um, and so that's kind of the core of the, yeah, you know, the way in which uh, crypto fits into the yeah, DAC vision. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a notion, Vitalik, of um, Daniel Schmachtenberger and his meta crisis mm -hmm. concepts where we have the increasing capabilities, increasing capacities of technology to do stuff, mm -hmm. good or bad, doesn't really matter, just stuff generally, neutrally. And some of that stuff sometimes ends up as like bad outcomes or just problems that need to be solved. And the concern here is that when technology introduces new problems to society, that society just comes up with centralized solutions to that problem. Or corporations and entrepreneurs can just move quickly and solve problems before uh, human humanity can come together to coordinate on a mutually assured platform, a mutually assured defensive technology to answer this. And I think what what I'm hearing from you is that, well, certain elements of cryptography, coordination via Ethereum, not allows for uh, a solution space to emerge that isn't merely just, you know, some large company slapping on that that patch onto society at large by saying, hey, here's our solution. It seems to be like a you know, the what you are uh, il illustrating here is like there is a middle ground between the chaotic production of highly capacity, high capacity technology and just like centralized companies solving that that problem space. Is that a fair illustration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like the really important uh, piece of this is basically yeah, creating these technologies that kind of improve the baseline defensiveness um, of the world while at the same time allowing the world to um, remain and um, you know, it could be even more of a pluralistic place, right? Um, so uh, avoiding the usual trap where um, you, know, you basically have uh, danger all the way up until one group just uh, takes over everything and imposes its will on everyone else. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So Vitalik, uh, you know, what you're proposing here is is maybe a philosophical framework for where um, where crypto fits, right? And uh, the reason I really like this is because it seems to be like kind of a big tent and it's something that I personally uh, resonate with. So you're basically saying you don't have to uh, pick the effective accelerationist, you know, the tech techno utopians uh, version of the world. Uh, you don't have to pick the technophobes vision of the world and kind of the Luddite doomerism uh, picture either. This is a, a third way, and you're calling this defensive or uh, decentralized. The D can stand for all sorts of different things or, or uh, democracy or differential uh, accelerationism. So this is DAC, basically. And crypto fits under the defensive technology in kind of the, the cyber uh, type of use case. And um, it feels very much like what you're advocating for is technologies that increase and enhance uh, human freedom. And so this can also mm -hmm. be a bulwark against maybe your AI risk scenario of uh, probability three, that you know the AI brings about totalitarian technologies, and now we have this defense uh, uh, you know, against it. And th the other thing I would say is, it seems like it's a very broad tent. It's like, who can't get behind some good old-fashioned defense? Right? We're not talking about something that could destroy the world. We're just talking about regular individuals and societies being able to defend against something that can destroy the world. And uh, I, I want you maybe to talk about this as a phil philosophical framework. Like, obviously, people in crypto are hearing this. I'm sure they resonate. Are you telling me that there's a, you know, a way to express, um, you know, my beliefs about crypto and this defensive and, and freedom enhancing and decentralized technology? You call it DAC? Like, sign me up. There's also, I think, some other camps that could listen to this and, and be interested. So you've got this section in your essay saying, is DIAC compatible with your existing philosophy? Uh, if you're an effective altruist, uh, this is a rebranding of the idea. If you're a libertarian, there's something here for you. If you're a pluralist, if you're a public health advocate, I'm wondering if you'd talk to the, the specific camps here and the value that they might find in subscribing to the DIAC uh, belief. Of course, yeah, I know you're not um, mm -hmm. you're pushing it. You're not trying to necessarily convert people, but in order to to explain it, maybe, can you talk about the wins mm -hmm. for for these various camps? Sure. I mean, any specific uh, camp you want me to start with? I would love you to start with the libertarians, actually, because I think we have a more than a few mm -hmm. listening, maybe. 
Sure. I mean, I think uh, the best way to think about this is it's a um, pathway to like basically yeah, preserve um, mineralic liberty going into the yeah, a, a much more technologically yeah, advanced uh, 21st century, right? And I think uh, the challenge that DIAC is looking at is basically that like there are lots of uh, technologies, um, including technologies that are being developed by governments or by corporations that are, um, you know, increasingly you know, working uh, with governments, right? Like uh, there was that recent, um, you know, like A16Z yeah, post uh, that was uh, like talking pretty enthusiastically about um you know, like American dynamism in defense, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, you know, it means military tech. Um, and uh, basically looking at, like, how do we create a, a world that with, through all of these changes and uh, through all of these pressures doesn't just kind of maneuver itself into being this incredibly yes, centralized place where you've basically yeah, got these... Uh, probably yeah, to somewhere between one to four of these uh, sort of big, um, you know, like super states uh, worldwide that uh, are in full control of their tech ecosystems. And uh, like regular people basically have no option except for, um, you know, like being stuck inside of uh, one of these with uh, no other uh, real, um, you know, options for getting out of that uh, equilibrium, okay. right? Um, and so... We can talk about like the possibility that uh, you know we'll have uh, much more um, um, you know, like a um, offensive um, AI in the hands of governments. Mm -hmm. um, you can also just look at existing trends in how like the internet is uh, not going the way that a lot of us uh, hoped, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, the concept of internet anonymity, for example, which is what was like a big hope of people, I think, like 10 or 20 years ago. But then the internet is obviously becoming an increasingly yeah, difficult place to actually be anonymous. And uh, a lot of uh, the reason why is uh, definitely just all of these, uh, you know, like cybersecurity yeah, um, issues and people just kind of naturally grappling for, um, you know, the centralized solutions for those problems because they're the easy ones. Um, and Diak basically yeah, tries to ask the question of like, well, there are threats and you can go after a yeah, threat either by um, hunting down all the wolves or by yeah, putting armor on the sheep, mm -hmm. right? And putting armor on the sheep is like philosophically much better if you can do that, right? Because uh, the problem with hunting down all the wolves is like, well... We have the wolves are some of us, and like we have to agree on who the wolves are, and like there is a risk that uh, you know the government's going to decide one day that you're one of the wolves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also, and the so, wolves don't uh, want to be hunted. <laughs> exactly, and if uh, you know, like we yeah, instead say like let's uh, make a, the world a more defense favoring place by default, so then like that is something that is much uh, harder to, um, you know, like twist into a yeah, narrative for like why, yeah, like go governments should just like go after all kinds of uh, all, all kinds of people that they don't like. Okay. Right? So, uh, so, so DIAC has some wins for uh, libertarians mm -hmm. here. H how about the solar punks? Mm -hmm. How about the Kevin Owaki regen mm -hmm. uh, type community mm -hmm. who are very oriented mm -hmm. on, um, you know, collective action and, uh, and human mm -hmm. coordination? Are there, are there wins in DIAC mm -hmm. for that community? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, Solarpunk, um, again, is, uh, I think, uh, a school that uh, you know, values um, hu uh, human flourishing. It um, values uh, cooperation. Um, it uh, also values uh, decentralization um, as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, ultimately there is, um, you know, a punk in uh, Solarpunk. It's not, um, you know, like solar monolith, right? Um and I think um, a lot of people in that camp are concerned about like the resilience um, of uh, the yeah, of the world going forward, our ability to survive different kinds of uh, risks, um, and are probably very cognizant of the fact that like all kinds of centralized actors, including both corporations and governments, can be a yeah, big problem in uh, making a lot of those risks larger. And what DIAC uh, basically yeah, says is it says, like, here is a yeah, set of tools 
that we can use to like just cut down on a lot of those risks um, just uh, across the board um, and make the uh, the the world one that is uh, like much more friendly to human flourishing without having to construct any of those kinds of monoliths, right? So like if you think about the uh, the idea of like, let's say the biodefense side of this, right? We can basically make a world that is much more protected against uh, diseases, natural and artificial pandemics, all kinds of things natively, just by having cleaner air. And this is, uh, an, it's a much more natural solution and it's a, um, you know, it, it's a yes. It's a solution to the that problem that really yeah, avoids some of the downsides of I um, mean, you know, like things like lockdowns that we've seen, which uh, you know can be justified if there's uh, enough of a yeah, health risk in a particular situation, but which also are just kind of massive, um, you know, like forced changes in the way that people just like live their regular lives with uh, their with their families and um, you know their regular relationships and their work i mean and so it's something that like it's an approach that allows us to be yeah, in in harmony with each other um i would uh, also um even say yeah in harmony with nature, uh, because I think uh, defense includes um, protect protecting the environment. Absolutely, um, it's uh, you know an approach that leverages local communities instead of uh, trying to uh, put power into these kind of big super states that uh, decide um, you know like what is uh, good and what is bad on behalf of like the entire world or on behalf of uh, much. Uh, larger groups of people um it's uh, a uh, world that that really yeah, empowers local coordination much more um and so i think uh, there's a lot of technologies within the uh, diac um, umbrella especially if you look at the uh, a kind of info defense category that we didn't go too much into that like really yeah, talks about improving social technology that uh, can uh, really yeah, make society both more defended against attacks um, and much more of uh, the kind of society that has the kinds of relationships that solar punks would want us to the have. The D can also stand for uh, democratic. And yeah, we didn't have a chance to mm -hmm. delve into that. But OK, so we got the libertarians. Mm -hmm. We got some wins in, in DAC for libertarians. We got some wins mm -hmm. for, for the solar punks. Let's talk about the original group that uh, we, we started this mm -hmm. entire episode with, which is on the one side mm -hmm. is someone like Mark Andreessen, who is uh, an EAC. He's effective accelerationism, full throttle, pedal to the metal, let's just do technology. And the other side is, you know, somebody who's maybe in the EA community, the effective altruist community. So can you get, can you get Mark Andreessen on board with, with uh, DIAC? And can you get mm -hmm. Eliezer Yudkowsky mm -hmm. on board uh, with mm -hmm. DIAC? Could they, could they both agree mm -hmm. about this one, mm -hmm. you know, like narrow subset of mm -hmm. uh, technology accelerationism, do you think? I mean, the post got retweeted by, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen um, and by uh, AI not kill everyone is a meme. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, like, <laughs> it's a success. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a pretty successful already. I mean, I think uh, the really big piece of it here is that I think uh, for the EAC side, the thing that it brings that uh, a lot of the previous philosophies don't bring is, I mean, one is there's just a... Uh, optimism about technology in general, but then there also is an alternate path forward, right? So the message is not just pause. The message is like, we proceed and here are some uh, alternative uh, routes for how to proceed differently. Um, and so if you are a builder, then like the, you are in, like, the perspective does not kind of frame you as being an incorrigible enemy, right? Like you can continue being a builder and there's mm -hmm. uh, plenty of uh, amazing roles for builders to do really great things within the uh, within the DAC context. And the uh, final stage of uh, DAC being successful, uh, like if we uh, imagine going out to the year 3000, like really does look like a... Uh, you know, like post singularity, yeah, I mean, like Kardashev type two, um, you know, like super advanced, uh, a, a, a technological society of uh, exactly the type that uh, Iak and Shred's humanist uh, people have been uh, dreaming about. And uh, for uh, people who are in 
in the yeah, AI safety camp. I mean, the concept of differential technology development is something that uh, a lot of effective altruists have actually been al already been talking about, right? So I yeah, included a link to uh, one of those posts. Um, but uh, I think the yeah, thing that it um, adds is this uh, kind of emphasis on a more democratic political approach. And like this probably is one of the big areas that uh, you know, like effective um, altruists uh, do get uh, uh, get criticized for, right? And like sometimes the criticism is, um, um, you know, like unfounded because like if you put uh, you know the governments in charge of like distributed public health funding, then like realistically it's going to be rich people, countries, governments, and like there's, I um, mean, you know, you're going to like. Like national governments have a huge track record of like not even caring about what's going on in Africa, whereas uh, effective altruists like actually already have put a lot of money in, right? But at the same time, once effective altruism starts uh, going away from putting money into obviously good, but we just might disagree on how good things, and into kind of manipulating like big political objects, then. Like, you start really needing to care much more about legitimacy. And to me, I feel like both of the big effective altruist related, um, you know, like fails, if you can call them, of the last two years, where, right, where one is the open AI situation and the other is F2X, FTX. I mean, to me, they both have to do with underrating legitimacy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, mm -hmm. SBF uh, was uh, clearly, yeah, I mean, he had all kinds of um, you know, like massive uh, problems. But one of them is definitely that he just overrated the extents to which he could become a massively negative value actor just by uh, like delegitimizing the uh, ideas that he uh, deeply cared about, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the open AI side, like basically you know, what we saw was we saw a, a seemingly earnest and well-intentioned effort to uh, kind of create a uh, kind of clamps on open AI, open, O the open AI effort that could try to kind of reduce its uh, potential to become super har uh, harmful by creating this uh, board that could push things in the other direction. But the problem is like, it tried to do all of this through a completely undemocratic and unaccountable board of five people that saw no need to even try to explain its actions to the wider public, right? Mm. And then what happened was like, well, it fired Sam Altman and then basically within three days well it was like in some ways like a pretty unprecedented political fail because what happened was the uh, employees of the company who are probably yeah you I mean, like capitalist to libertarian leaning um just like tech software types in a lot of cases formed an impromptu union to side with the billionaire ceo against the board <laughs> right <laughs> like, that's like a pretty big fail if you think about it that way, right? Like, congrats, you got software engineers to unionize, <laughs> except they're standing behind the billionaire, right? And, uh, you know, if... Uh, and so I think uh, the, the thing that, like, DAC ideas can uh, really uh, bring here is uh, basically bringing back some of these concerns about uh, legitimacy and, like, understanding that, uh, you know, you're not just spending um, money points, but you're also spending social capital points. And, like, you really need to take that seriously. Um, and, like, bringing that in in a way that's not just sort of an adjunct, but that is a really core part of the philosophy, right? Like, it's a core part of the DAC philosophy that we are trying to create a world that is more defense favoring from in anyone's perspective, regardless of whether or not you agree with any specific actor that is uh, going to be, uh, that, that would enforce like its own idea of, um, you know, who the wolves are and who the wolves are not, so, right? Vitalik, and, the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. last group to, to ask you about here on kind of um, mm -hmm. compatible philosophy that's near and dear to, to our hearts is how about the crypto tribes? So we have uh, Bitcoiners, we have Ethereans, we have people who are into Solana and Cosmos, and there's a lot of tribalism. Do you think something like DAC, we can all stack hands on something like DAC and say, hey, these are a common set of uh, core values, defensive decentralization technology that, that we all agree on. Yeah, we have our differences with respect to implementation. But um, can we all unite behind something like DAC? Is it that wide of a tent to <laughs> bring the crypto tribes mm -hmm. together? I think it absolutely could be. 
Um, and I think uh, this is one of those places where I think it's uh, it's good to give a positive shout out to like some of the positive um, aspects of the Bit of the Bitcoin community, which is that like there definitely is a strong sub community in there that cares about non blockchain decentralization tech, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is Bitcoiners who really support things like Noster. There is Bitcoiners who support Tor and uh, you know like things like Internet Freedom Tech. There's Bitcoiners who have supported more secure operating systems. There's, uh, and then there's uh, e Ethereum people who have also supported, you um, know, like all kinds of uh, things in uh, each of those categories as well, right? And and so, I think the yeah, idea of viewing the blockchain world as being one part of this somewhat larger thing, which is a yeah, decentralization favoring vision of cybersecurity, and then seeing that itself as being one picture in a uh, broader uh, vision of uh, you know like decentralization friendly uh, like pushing the offense defense balance uh, strongly toward defense is something that ethereum people and uh, and bitcoin people and uh, solana people um, as well can uh, absolutely get behind but talk i'd like to throw a different candidate for what the d means for in dac mm -hmm. um mine might be Directional acceleration. Oh, I thought you were going to say um, David. <laughs> I, I was going to say that too. <laughs> uh, that, mm. that can be a different topic with the Dave Dow. Um, <laughs> but, but the so to me, there's there's like the tribal debates between de uh, decelerationism and accelerationism, or effective mm. altruism mm -hmm. and accelerationism. And when there is these tribal debates, usually mm -hmm. the weaknesses inside of one tribe never really get addressed by that tribe because they only ever mm -hmm. really argue in relation to a different tribe. Mm -hmm. The way I hear this this blog post and hear you speaking about is like, hey, we we're going to move forward in scientific progress. We're going to have technology that has higher capacities. And now it's really just a matter of picking our direction, our priorities, and where we want to go and what technologies we want to prioritize first. And I, Because I think generally most people accept that technology has helped the world uh, over the the grand mm -hmm. over the grand arc of time, and now mm -hmm. it's really more about choosing which direction we go in, uh, rather mm -hmm. than blindly saying yes, it's forward. It's more mm -hmm. about saying f yes, forward and over here mm -hmm. in this particular mm -hmm. direction. Uh, how mm -hmm. would you feel about directional accelerationism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh... With the caveat that, like, it's totally possible to create a directional acceleration story that I totally disagree with, but uh, you know, right. as long as we we yeah, still have understand. to debate in which direction. Exactly, yeah. as long as we understand which direction is. I mean, you think uh, right. yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Vitalik, as as we maybe uh, conclude this episode, you've given us a fantastic tour of um, this whole debate, the societal debate in, in this context in crypto and a great definition of uh, DAC, which is, um, I think, it, just a fantastic uh, philosophy that I think ba bankless listeners will probably take some time to, to mull over. But your article concludes uh, with this. It, it includes with some optimism for, for human potential here. Um, you say, human beings are deeply good. And I got to confess, like uh, in my darkest moments, of course, I I, uh, I sometimes doubt whether that is actually true. And if you look at, you know, even crypto in, in 2022, um, I feel like uh, we all came out of that collectively as an industry pretty beat up, pretty doubtful that uh, human beings are, are deeply good. But you say this, I love technology because technology expands human potential. We are the brightest star. 10,000 years ago, we could build some hand tools, change which plants grow on a small patch of land, and build basic houses. Today, we can build 800-meter tall towers, store the entirety of recorded human knowledge in a device that we can hold in our hands, communicate instantly across the globe, double our lifespan, and live happy and fulfilling lives without fear of our best friends regularly dropping dead of disease. Zooming out, uh, we have come quite a ways, haven't we? Uh, what grounds your belief that human beings are, are deeply good, Vitalik? Um, I mean, I think uh, just uh, like what other thing even uh, remotely compares to us, right? Yeah, this is the uh, question to ask, right? You know, the universe is uh, a very uh, lifeless and uh, unforgiving place, right? Where we've had, uh, you know, like first... Uh, 
nine billion or seven to nine billion years of uh, the just uh, stars and planets uh, crashing into each other and uh, randomly uh, creating supernovas that would just completely wipe away yeah, everything within light years without thinking about it. And then we had uh, four billion years of uh, life, but life that was uh, very nasty, very brutish, uh, very short, and uh, that uh, basically yeah, involved uh, milk predators uh, constantly yeah, running around and uh, eating uh, prey and everyone being on the yeah, brink of uh, the dropping dead of disease and starvation. And, uh, you know, there is not a single example of uh, a cat that modifies its eating behavior because of a principled stand that uh, killing mice is wrong, right? Like, that is just not a thing that happens. Um, whereas uh, with humans, there are plenty of humans that have uh, written entire screeds on why this is the case and that have made, like, huge personal sacrifices to, um, you know, protect the uh, people or um, animals or, or, or plants that they care about. And I think uh, to the extent that this... Uh, happens it's incredibly amazing and incredibly beautiful and i think uh, if humanity continues on a positive trajectory then the uh, amount of uh, good that we can do just multiplies even further exponentially from there right like in the 21st century i think there is a uh, big chance that we're finally going to turn the corner on uh, factory farmed animals and uh, probably the biggest moral catastrophe that you still can blame uh, humans for is uh, something that uh, we will actually uh, end up uh, moving beyond um, and then uh, to you know 1 billion years from now the sun is uh, scheduled to get bright, get so bright that uh, life on Earth is not going to be possible anymore, right? And, uh, you know, does the sun think about the moral consequences of this act that it's going to make? Well, no, it does not, right? But humans, well, what can we do? Well, you know, we um, can um, sprinkle, um, you know, like uh, ca calcium carbonate or sulfur into the air and uh, compensate and uh, reduce the amount of light that reaches the surface. We can, uh, you know, like build giant mirrors in space to reflect the light. We can uh, go and terraform Mars. We can uh, do all kinds of things. And so if, uh, you know, the beauty of earthly light, life is still going to shine two billion years from now, it will be because of us. Right. And so I think we carry the torch of this uh, just enormous potential that is unparalleled in any other thing in the universe that we currently have evidence uh, of the uh, existence of. And uh, it's our job to do a good job of carrying that torch and uh, carry the torch forward. What a fantastic way to end it. I Beautiful. think that's what the the DIAC movement, it sounds like, is all about. And I, you know, I could say uh, Bankless is certainly part of that uh, movement. And I, I'm hopeful with crypto, we can help mm -hmm. carry that torch uh, further. So I'll, I'll leave maybe Bankless listeners with, with this line from your article. We are the brightest star. There's a lot of good that can come from ongoing human progress into the stars and beyond, but there are big forks in the road and we need to choose carefully. Accelerate, but accelerate carefully and well. Vitalik Buren, thank you so much for joining us today. Some action items for you, Bankless Nation. Uh, link to the tweet thread that we discussed today, My Techno Optimism. That's a Vitalik's article. We'll include a link to that and also the article itself. Risks and disclaimers, of course. Crypto is risky. So is uh, philosophy. So is technology. So many so of the things we talked about. Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, you could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.